Okay. Hello, everybody. How you doing? Are you ready to get into this? This is, uh, get your favorite beverage. I'm, I'm going hard today. and I'm usually a Sprite girl, but I think I need the caffeine. I don't know. It might make me more anxious. Oh, look, he's got his bracelets on. He's now been demoted from attorney to convicted felon, getting ready to be sentenced. This should be great. Well, not great. Look at him. Mm. What could he possibly be going through? What important paperwork? Oh, look, let's verse. Oh, let's get to the, mm, get the Bible ready. Oh, my goodness. I'm already annoyed, and he hasn't even begun speaking. He hasn't even begun to, spoke, Thank to you, speak. Please be seated. See, I can't even talk. Do you think he can be quiet during that time, or is he going to have to say something? Oh, it looks like our um, our fellow behind him got a haircut for the occasion, perhaps. Thinking my last day to deal with him, hopefully, or maybe last two. You know he's not going to be able to keep quiet. Look at him. He's checking himself out. You look just as hideous as you did before. I'm sorry, but that's... No, really, I'm not sorry. See that jumpy stuff going in the light that I really can't explain that happens sometimes on here, but I guess we'll just deal with it the best we can. Let me try to... The court will call State of Wisconsin versus Darrow E. Brooks, case number 21 CF 1848. May have the appearances, please. Uh, good morning, Judge. Sue Apper, Leslie Basie, and Zach Wichow appearing for the state. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Daryl Brooks Jr. Um, what? Oops. Five dollars. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's enough to make a I got. I got to switch back. Sorry, guys. When he said his name, see what happened. Don't worry. I'll get us back there. Okay. Sorry. I'm going back to the beginning. I just when he said his name, I was like, "What?" Well, you see what happened. Don't worry. We'll get to hear it again. In case we were like in shock. That means he is the person who did all those things. Okay, maybe I didn't move it far ahead enough. That's all right, we could just look at him. Yeah, see, checking himself out again. Sorry about that. But we can have time to take our deep breaths and and thank you all for hanging in here with me with this. I'm sure after all this, everything's done. The court will call State of Wisconsin versus Daryl E. Brooks, case number 21 CF 1848. May have the appearances, please. Uh, good morning, Judge. Sue Apper, Leslie Basie, and Zach Wachow appearing for the state. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Appearance, please. Uh, good morning, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Daryl Brooks, Jr. I'm here for this matter by special appearance. It is not my uh, intention to bring any controversy to you, Your Honor, or your court today. Um, I'm wondering how I may settle this matter. Um, is there anyone here in the court that can give me a rendering of the account? Oh, please stop. Please, if it Mr. Brooks, your appearance is 
noted, uh, the court will not be responding to that last question. We are here today to start the sentencing hearing in this case. Uh, this, of course, following your conviction on all counts, following the jury trial that concluded um, in late October. I will acknowledge, sir, there are a number of documents you filed today. One is a motion for stay pending appeal. There are two ICFs that came in as well, both addressed Idiot to me. complaint forms. One related to court costs and fees, requesting a copy of the record at the court's expense. And then the other one also requesting a certified copy of the record written and recorded uh, statement that you're waiving all fees and court costs and that you would be appearing by special appearance. Um, Nothing special about that. The court's not going to take these up initially, sir. Um, in order for a court to consider a motion for stay pending appeal, the matter must be finally adjudicated, uh, including uh, the signing of a judgment of conviction. Uh, once that is done, I will schedule the motion for stay pending appeal accordingly. That way the state can also have proper notice of that and be prepared to address that with the court. In terms of your request to waive costs and fees, um, I will interpret your written ICFs as a request that at sentencing I waive costs associated with these convictions to the extent that is allowable under the law. As far as the record is concerned, this court is not the custodian. As far as the, anything in the written record or the file, the clerk of court is the custodian. As far as the uh, official transcripts of the proceedings, uh, those will need to be prepared. Uh, and there are costs associated with that. And there is a form that you or a lawyer acting on your behalf would need to file in order for this court to consider that. Uh, so I'll take all of that under advisement, but will not be addressing that specifically other than what I had just noted. Uh, the other thing I want to take up preliminarily before uh, I hear from individuals who are here to make statements is the letter that I sent to the parties um, yesterday it does address one topic that I wanted to address at the beginning of the hearing today, and that is your request for individuals to speak at sentencing did not contain a request that they appear by Zoom. I wanted to clarify that with you, sir. If you were requesting that they appear by Zoom and make their statements if they're not present in the courtroom on your behalf when the appropriate time comes. Um, yes, um, I, I apologize for that, Your Honor. I didn't know that it was it some type of uh, step that I was supposed to include in that to make sure that they would appear by Zoom? I'm a little confused, so I, I apologize for Sir, that. Sir, I don't know where any of these individuals live, whether they are local and can make it here or not. Um, and I had anticipated that either of the parties, if there was a request for someone to appear by Zoom, that would be specifically made so that I could then take the appropriate steps. There is time. My intention would be that when... Uh, the state has rested their portion of the sentencing hearing. All of their speakers have spoken and they have given their sentencing argument uh, that I would, uh, depending on where it's at, probably take a break, start up the Zoom at that point, allow the individuals who wish to make a statement on your behalf to do so one at a time. But otherwise, I wasn't going to keep the Zoom up because the proceedings are being live streamed. Um, is that acceptable to you, sir? Uh, in, in part, um, so I'm, I'm still a little confused mm. on uh, yeah, what's next? how would I get the uh, Zoom link to those who wish to speak on my behalf? My understanding is your mom has contacted the clerk of court's office. Um, I haven't addressed that in any way, but I would then give my staff permission to reach out to her. I believe she has left her phone number and we could do that and provide that Zoom information to her and I presume she would be able to get it to the individuals on your list. It's very important though that only those individuals appear on the Zoom. That's the only people I will approve um, unless they're here in court, of course. Uh, and then the other parameters are that um, that individuals who are on the Zoom for that portion of the sentencing hearing keep their microphones off, their cameras 
off until they are making a statement and they have to be identified with uh, obviously the name that was provided by you and only those individuals. What I don't want to see is, you know, one person and then 10 people behind them. That's not what I approved. So um, do you understand that, sir? I, I have a quick question about that. Mm -hmm. like right. when, one of the um, people that wish to speak on my behalf would be uh, the mother of my youngest daughter. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure when exactly she'll be speaking. And it, it's a chance that she would actually have my daughter with her, with that. How old is your daughter? She's eight. As long as the child is remains quiet and doesn't interrupt, I will allow that one exception. Okay, thank you. All right, so I will instruct uh, Madam Clerk to let uh, my other clerk know that the Zoom information can be released uh, to your mom. There's a meeting ID and passcode, uh, and that can be provided to the other individuals on the list. Now, are so are the 20 people, 20 or more, going to all be um, speaking on his behalf via Zoom? Or, or do they have a, um, are they going to be coming into the courtroom? Yeah, I'm, that's definitely sarcasm. And I'll, I anticipate that that won't be until sometime this afternoon that we get to that portion of the sentencing hearing. So and if they have, because um, I know my grandmother would like to speak, but she's very elderly. So if she has any um, trouble like accessing it, will someone probably on my behalf be able to walk her through that? Or? Well, I assume she might need help with that or someone yeah, will be available. She's 80, so I don't, I don't think she's, well, I know that she's not the most. I trust they will have sad. that all figured out, sir. So, all right. All right, then. Is there anything else uh, the parties wish me to address preliminarily before I turn to the state? Yes, Your Honor, I do have a few preliminary matters, please. Uh, the filings that you just referenced from Mr. Brooks, I did not see those in the electronic queue this morning. Uh, would it be possible for the state to get copies, please? Yes, they were, I believe were hand delivered. Or Zach may be, Mother Clerk Zach may be doing that right now. We'll make sure, but Teresa can make copies for you as well. Okay. I also wanted to ask a, a couple of housekeeping matters, Your Honor, as far as uh, timing and scheduling. If we complete the hearing today, then I assume that eliminates the need for the hearing tomorrow. Is that correct? Or do you see a, a version where we come back tomorrow no matter what? I do see a version where we come back tomorrow no matter what. I, I want to be able to digest the statements from everyone um, and process them accordingly. There's going to be quite a few for both sides, and I think it's appropriate that I take the overnight to do that and come back tomorrow to render okay. the sentence. Okay, thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, the other uh, question is we have the easel uh, back in the courtroom. Some people did want to display some foam boards. Um, if it meets the court's approval, we'll leave it at this location and then just uh, pass up the uh, exhibits and Detective Reichlin can display them if that's okay with the court. Well, I'd certainly like Mr. Brooks to be able to see them as well. Um, Mr. Brooks, are you able to see the easel from where you are? Otherwise, I could have it put in the witness stand too. And then Detective Reglin could just sure. uh, kind of facilitate that. Sure, okay. That will work. And then other individuals have brought um, digital photographs that we'll be displaying. Um, so we'll need your clerk's assistance with that. And again, we'll be using uh, Ms. Gussie at the back table to accomplish that. All right, thank you. All right, anything else from you, sir, before we start this morning? Um, yeah, just really quick. Um, uh. Very quick reference to um, the ICF. Um, I did address oh, come uh, on. the ICF to uh, You know what? I just got to say, this is the victim's day. Do we really, really, really have to bring up your idiot complaint forms? Come on. Oh, my gosh. He really is not going... You know, but that's okay. Clerk, uh, clerk of courts, in regards to uh, the record, 
So I did, I did, um, I should have mentioned that when you was talking about it, but I did, mm-hmm. uh, actually I addressed it to her, um, personally. I trust she'll respond in due course then. Anything else? Uh, not at this time. All right. I will note that it appears yesterday some restitution information was filed. Uh, was that, uh, hand delivered to Mr. Brooks, Attorney Opera. The restitution information, yes. was that hand delivered to Mr. Brooks? Yes. Everything we e filed yesterday was provided to Mr. Brooks personally in the jail yard. Right. Okay, let's see. Is he going to say he didn't receive anything? Is he going to, please, please make me wrong, really, make me wrong. And, and, and say that you did receive it. Okay, let's see what he says. To that, Your Honor, um, there were a number of documents that I did not accept. Oh, okay, he did not accept them. Uh -huh. Well, Madam Clerk, print them off. There is a restitution request from the- Don't worry, Madam Clerk will print them off. See, that's what, what, just, I'll try not to go on too long. I know we're ready to get on, but I'm just like, I've got to say, He's always, you know, he's always so worried about his ICFs and this and that and them being time stamped and, and the originals and all of that. And yet, when it's time for him to receive documents, nah, he's, 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 gonna, he's not going to accept them. Ugh, so maddening. Walker Shaw. School district uh, totaling well, that's just one piece of it. Let me look at the letter again. There's a letter from the state and then our um, crime victim compensation request as well. The state will be requesting $47,193.29 to EMC Insurance Company on behalf of the school district of Waukesha and additionally requesting $124,000 220 and 65 cents to crime victim compensation. Um, that's the program through the Department of Justice and supporting documentation, uh, I believe was also filed. Let me just look for that. Well, can you say it again? And we'll have it printed off. It was delivered to him yesterday, whether he accepted it or not. That's right. I don't know, but it's available to him in the jail, Your Honor. All right, under you know what? I love Sue Opper. Now, we all know that that is his number one. He cannot stand her. And it's because she's, a, number one, she's a woman. Number two, she is so much smarter than him. Number three, she is not one bit afraid to speak Look at her, look at her face. And I don't blame her. She is done. I mean, she has fought hard for this community and fought well along with her, her other two. And all of a sudden, I can't even think of them right now. Leslie and Zach, let's just say that. Yeah, Basie and Zach Wichow. Done an amazing job. And, you know, she is so done with him. And I don't blame her. And he, he is... And I have often the way he speaks to her and I've often worried about her safety, quite honestly, you know, like, but then I start thinking, you know, if he gets someone from the outside, does he even really have anyone from the outside that could harm her? But I do, I have thought about that because you can tell he just holds nothing but contempt from her. And it's because she is fearless and she's really well, many of them are my heroes, but I just think she did outstanding, but I love it. She doesn't have time for him. She's done with him. Understood. All right, thank I you. I don't have it. Just for the record. Madam Clerk will print it off. We yep. know you don't have it because you didn't accept it. Okay, yeah, I'm going to probably be breaking and y'all just be patient with me. But I will not interrupt when the, when the when the victims make their impact statements, except maybe, you know, I won't. Talk over them. How about that? You'll have it. 
I don't, Short clip. I don't know if they, where they put it after I didn't. Accept it. The reason why I, I want to state this for the record, the reason you why don't I care. is because I didn't know what it was. Oh, come when on. They came, when they Please. came to my um, cell, I was sleeping, so I was just like, ah, whatever, I'm not getting up. Yeah. So it wasn't like a exchange or anything like that. It was just like, hey, we got some. Yeah, you're full of excuses and lies as ever. Oh, my gosh. You know, you've had everything delivered to you. You leave it in the trash. You've left it in the other uh, cell where you had to wait. We all know this. There's no, really, there's no secrets or surprises left in you. We just need to get you in the prison, which you already are. But now we're just pretending we are going through this process as if you weren't yet. Here we go. I mean, I'm just like, yeah, I'm not. He's like, all right. Yeah. All right, Valerie. Kind of like his attitude when he ran over the people. I'm just thinking about these poor people waiting for their moment, and he's still stealing their time. Oh, okay. Noted for the record, but again, it is being provided to you this morning, um, and you'll be able to review that as you see fit. And he won't. All right. Then, Attorney Upper, one last question from the <gasps> court. Do you Gosh. anticipate making your sentencing recommendation at the conclusion of all of the other statements being made. Yes. All right. all right. I can't wait for that one. With that, then, um, you may commence. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. I appreciate that. I do intend to just make some very brief preliminary statements to the court and then uh, commence with the uh, individuals who are present and have asked to speak. I just want to um, state again for the record, we have organized the individuals who want to provide a verbal statement to the court into three or four groups. Um, I think we're, we're at three, we're at four. Okay, we're at four groups. Um, we have the first group present in the courtroom, Your Honor, and uh, along with their support persons and family members and things like that. Um, we will uh, go through the first group and then request that brief break to uh, trade out the groups if that's agreeable to the court. I just want the court to be aware uh, and state something that's maybe obvious, but maybe not. The people that are speaking to this court are direct victims of this crime. They were uh, either charged individuals or uh, representatives of the groups, such as the Blazers or the bank or whatever. You're very familiar with these groups now after having gone through trial. These are people uh, with a, you know, a direct link to either someone that was hurt or injured or killed. Um, that's who we're presenting to you today. Obviously, there could have been thousands of people um, that would want to share with this court their thoughts, impressions, and the impact that this crime had on them. We did not turn anyone away, but some individuals did contact our office and expressed a desire to contact the court or I'm sorry, to speak to the court, we directed them to write the court a letter if they felt it was appropriate. I don't know if the court received any such um, written materials. We also provided some written impact statements on behalf of our charge victims. I know the court has those and has uh, very likely reviewed those already. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time with my thoughts and impressions right now because I think what's really um, most important for is for this court to hear from these families. And the reason I say that is, you know, Judge, that at trial, um, we asked some cursory questions about the injuries that were received and the impact that these crimes had on the individuals that were directly involved. But we didn't spend a lot of time on that. And I think um, this court is really going to be astounded to hear the level of injury that many of these uh, people suffered, many children suffered the impact, the life-changing impact it's had on them. So this will be different and in new information than what we presented at trial. And I think it's very relevant and important for Your Honor to consider um, when you're uh, uh, deciding on a fair and appropriate sentence and knowing the gravity of the crime, the seriousness of the situation and the impact that it had on the community to hear from these families directly as to what they went through. And again, um, 
this was touched on at trial as far as the physical injury versus the emotional injury and the trauma that has been suffered. So um, I think um, that will be important as well for this court to appreciate uh, this defendant's conduct. We're past the guilty uh, finding. He's been convicted. Now it's time to talk about what exactly his conduct did to our community and to these families. So That's right. um, these uh, speakers are grouped, not necessarily within um, the groups as they march down the street, but there is some logic to, um, so we're not gonna bounce all over the place is what I'm trying to say. We'll, we'll try and uh, clump them together uh, to make the most uh, sense to the court and um, with the court's permission we have a set lineup, of course. Uh, we may need to um, be a little bit fluid depending on somebody's uh, emotional state or um, desire to speak when it's their appointed turn. There are some individuals that have said they're going to try and read their statement to the court, but they may not be able to get through it, in which case I believe Jen Dunn will um, step in and read the remaining, remainder of the statement for them. Thank you. Um, would you please confirm on the record that the state has complied with victim rights? Yes, we will confirm that, Your Honor. Thank you. And then please give the court a heads up when a juvenile is next yes. so that uh, the cameras can take the appropriate steps as well. Yes, absolutely. And for the record, we did provide a list to the uh, cameramen from Court TV or uh, individuals from Court TV, and uh, we're trying to assist them in that regard as well. We want to thank them again um, for their uh, high degree of concern for obeying uh, the court's order and their respect and uh, uh, intention to strictly adhere to uh, maintaining the privacy rights of these victims. So they've been uh, absolutely very professional in that regard, Your Honor. Thank you. And then just lastly, because I would like to keep track and Obviously, I will honor however they want to introduce themselves, but if you could also tell me which victim they relate to, if it's not self-evident, sure, that would be great as well, and I'm going to keep a list. Okay. Right, Thank go you. Go ahead. All right, then. I believe our first speaker would be Lori Logan. And if it pleases... How's the volume? <laughs> Listen up, Brooks. Listen up. It's their no, day. If it pleases the court, Your Honor, one of my staff will actually go let Court TV know when a minor is coming next. Thank you. I All right. And uh, are you going to say the victim that you relate to, or I can tell the court this is for victim UU? Thank you. Good morning. I'm addressing the court. Is the microphone on? Yeah, it is. Okay. I'm addressing the court, but I also want to direct my comments to Daryl Brooks, Jr. My name is Lori Locken. I was walking with the Catholic community of Waukesha, my church family. We were celebrating the joy of the season in preparation for the birth of Jesus when you made your decision to drive through the parade route. It truly amazes me that you deny your accountability for the damage and hurt that you have willfully caused. In the years ahead, I urge you to carefully consider the sorrow and grief of the Waukesha community and the world at large. Ponder the loss of lives within our families, the physical and emotional injuries that may never heal, and the sense of personal safety that you robbed from us. As for me, you never gave me a chance. I turned around and it was only seconds before you hit me square on. I clearly remember feeling the impact. Okay, whoa, whoa. The searing? Right there? Hang on guys, I got... I I kind of want to try to write down the names of these people that are speaking. Um, because every one, but just look at him. While I do that, look at him. The utter disrespect, rolling his eyes. That just, oh my God, that is just absolutely maddening. 
And now this woman can sit there and keep calm in her voice. You know, that's a good position for him. He looks like a, a zombie right there. I think they said her name was Laurie Loke, Loke, I think. I think I can look on the victim map though, because they all should be remembered because these, these guys, many of them have long time health issues that will never leave, leave him, not him, them, because of what he chose to do on that day. And the fact that he rolls his eyes, it just absolutely infuriates me. And I'm sure y'all feel the same, but I'm sorry. I do want to let this, this woman speak, be respectful, but I just, I can't, I can't with him. The pain of that blow is as clear to me today as it was a year ago. Since then, I'm healing as best as I can from the physical injuries but you took away my peace and my trust, something that I will never regain. My prayer for you is that you will find your salvation in the midst of this evil. I hope that you will repent for the heartache you have caused so many. Yeah, go to your Bible. Mm -hmm. I too pray that your own personal wounds that you have sustained through your life, which has created so many demons in you, will be healed through this action. Thank you. Oh, look at him. Oh, yeah, you shake your head. Oh, I want to rip your hairline out. Thank the court for this opportunity. Uh, How I'm gracious. Mitchell, formerly known as victim ZZ. To you, Mr. Brooks, I'm charged 52. Um, on November 21st, uh, 2021, I was marching with the Catholic community of Waukesha and the Waukesha Christmas Parade. I was walking in the back and I noticed our banner was flying up because of the wind. So I went up the hole down the middle with, uh, uh, so people could read it. I was joined by a priest uh, who helped hold it down. Uh, we walked almost the entire joyful parade route. When uh, uh, something caught my attention, I turned around and saw a headlight. Uh, and then I was hit. I didn't see the driver and I didn't see the type of vehicle. I flew over the hood and ended up on the ground with eight broken ribs, bruised lung, Wow. Fractured hand, finger, and my face was flashed open in several places, required stitches. Strangers and friends came to my aid as they lay bleeding in the street. I spent three nights in an ICU. The recovery me was slow. My hand still has painful cramps that freeze in my fingers. But I know I was lucky. Others had a lot worse injuries and six died. The impact on my family was great. My wife was home recuperating from surgery when she received the call that was hurt badly and on the way to a hospital trauma center. Not able to drive yet, she had to wait for my son and his fiance to pick her up and drive her to Oconomowoc. And after I was released, she had to do a 180 from patient to be my nurse and help me in even the most basic tasks. The stress had slowed her recovery. The continued pain was a major factor on me giving up a part-time job I enjoyed. We had to rely on family and friends for transportation to doctors for follow-up care for months. Neighbors pitched in to do my yard work and snow removal. Youth from the neighborhood decorated the inside of our house for Christmas. This crime had a ripple effect throughout the community. I do want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your diligent sacrifice to be here. I tell people I was blessed because I didn't see the carnage that night. I just saw people helping me. But the jury and all of you had to watch the entire awful scene on videos and hear detailed reports of what happened. I'm sure that's going to stay with all of you. I wanted to thank the judge for her patience and knowledge, the police, Hector Casey, for their thorough investigation and quick arrest, the prosecution for presenting such a strong case. A special thank you to Jen Dunn, Carrie, and the entire victim's assistance team that informed, comforted, and listened to the many people impacted by this tragic event. Finally, I can't bring myself to thank the defendant but the response to the evil act he did shined a spotlight on how strong, supportive, and loving community we live in. Many people and organizations stepped up to help me. Family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, first responders, Aurora, doctors, nurses, my church family, the Catholic community of Waukesha, Knights of Columbus, AOH, United for Waukesha Community Fund, Catholic Charities, and so many strangers offered support and prayers. The vast majority of people are good. 
Here, here. That's so true. We have to remember that. That's it. Then there is Mr. Brooks. He is a unique individual who can have a clear conscience after over, running over kids like speed bumps and killing six people. Mm -hmm. I would suggest someone without a conscience. He doesn't ask for forgiveness. He doesn't admit to doing anything wrong. It is never his fault. When he slapped a woman, it was her fault because she made him mad. Mm -hmm. I believe if he made it home that night with the red SUV, he would have told his mom the damage wasn't his fault. He was in a hurry and people didn't get out of his way. Some crazy old fat gray hair guy body slammed his hood. <laughs> I didn't watch all the trial, but the parts I saw that I saw showed that Mr. Brooks had a lack of empathy for his victims or remorse for his actions. The only regrets he seemed to have is that he was caught in the impact on his own life. Free, he would probably not drive through another parade, but chances are someone so self-centered as Mr. Brooks will hurt other people again. Yep. The only life he seems to value is his own. I don't believe that Mr. Brooks will think about me or any of his victims ever. The feeling is mutual. I really don't think much about him now, but you when shouldn't. the prison door closes on this felon, I won't think about him again. I do hope Mr. Brooks will use the Bible for more than a courtroom prop. He may want to start with the basics that I know his family had taught him, thou shalt not kill. But then I want to read Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Your Honor, I hope you give him the time to read and study the Bible. Mr. Brooks did everything he could to try to make the trial a circus. It is not a circus. It's not even about Mr. Brooks. Today, the court will hear what the trial is about, the victims. And as former Victor ZZ, I would ask the court for a sentence that keeps the defendant, Darrell E. Brooks Jr., away from society forever. Thank you. The best way to handle it. Beautifully said. I tell you what, these people have so much courage. I don't know if I'd be, well, I can't say, we can't ever say what we'd be. But the courage, it just shows, it just, each person that speaks just shows how much of a coward Brooks was and is. Wow. He looks like an idiot. Mr. Brooks, my name is Jason Peckloff and I'm with the Catholic Community of Waukesha. I was one of the victims you hit with the SUV you were driving on November 21st. What you did to my Catholic community and to the city of Waukesha show that you had no regard for life. What makes it more disappointing that it, you have shown no remorse for what you have done. While you're sitting in prison, I want you to reflect what you have done. I want you to reflect that you nearly took my life. I almost lost the chance to see my wife and kids again. I may have never had the chance to love or hug them again. You intentionally harmed my community, whether it was physical or psychological. Tell him. You stole our innocent that day. Before that tragedy you created, it was a beautiful day we all experienced and never thought an evil thing like this could ever happen at a parade. My friend, myself, and the Waukesha Catholic community were asking parishioners and their families to participate in this parade. Imagine the guilt we must all bear for the rest of our lives. Because of your actions, I was out of work for about six weeks. Then I had to go back part-time because of my sustained injuries. Because of your actions, the multiple lacerations you created leaked out of the bandages and onto my bed, comforter, and sheets. What an awful visual to have. Because of your actions, I could have lost my foot. Thank God my nurse friend was checking on me. Because of your actions, my wife cannot get the images out of her mind of what you have done. You have forever scarred her. Oh, because yeah. of your actions, an... my wife had to hand oh. over my children to our community friends to check on my lifeless body. Because of your actions, my children, 
four and six at the time, had to go with a grieving friend to find her own child that was in lockdown. It took a while for them to be I'm reunited. Sorry. Because of your actions, my children are scared to death when they had to cross the same street you drove down. They were bawling and begging me not to cross the street. Hmm. Because of your actions, I need to reassure my children that this that it is safe at parades. Not sure they ever feel 100% safe. Because of your actions, not all people in our community are ready to go back to the parades. Again, you stole that innocent from them. Because of your actions, my children are scared of sirens. Because of your actions, they were scared of red SUVs every time they saw one. They cried and hid. Because of your actions, I walked into the entrance of my children's school and felt like a triage unit. I saw children on crutches and a walker. What an awful image to be burned into my memory. Because of your actions, I feel terrible. I could not help my community and the city by testifying during the trial. Your cowardly actions did this. That's right. Speak it. Your actions forced my family to seek out therapy and resolve in their minds what happened. Your actions made a second guess what we did that day. What could we have done differently? During this trial, you show no remorse. It makes you look like a monster. Mm -hmm. During the trial, you show little regard and respect to the court. It makes you look disrespectful. During the trial, you treated multiple witnesses terribly. You were trying to twist the words of our pastor, who is a man of the cloth. You made a comment to a witness you injured that he was walking fine now. It makes you mm -hmm. a callous jerk. Sure does. Despite what you have done to my community, I forgive you. Forgiveness does not remove the need for justice. Justice must be served and you must go to prison. My prayer is that forgiveness will heal your wounds and the wounds for the city. Thank you. Wow. Look at him. I think it's so funny. Oh, man. I would want to leap across the room if I were the victims. I do, and I'm not the victim. He is such a monster. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Margaret Petulis, victim BBB, count 54. I know I am blessed to be here today to present my statement to the court. Daryl Brooks's choices on November 21st, 2021, took a toll mentally, physically, and emotionally on me, as well as affecting my family. I remember the moment someone yelled car, and I turned to see a vehicle behind and to the right of me. My thought was, what is this vehicle doing here? After that moment, I have a void in my memory. My mind will let me see what happened. I remember my thoughts. Oh my God, this can't be happening. Please, not my hip, not my leg. My next memory is laying, lying on the ground with a person from our group and a nurse talking to me and asking how I was. They worked on keeping me calm and from going into shock. I will always be grateful to them. Every night I would lay awake and replay the incident to see if I could get the memory back. Months of counseling and the passage of time have helped me be somewhat okay with not knowing what happened. One of my fears is that when I least expect the memory, least expect it, the memory will return. After being impacted by the vehicle, I was laying on the ground with severe pain to my left leg. Emergency people stopped by and one questioned whether I had been shot and all I could think of is why would I have been shot? I was eventually lifted into a police SUV and taken to Waukesha Memorial Hospital. I was examined and was released after being diagnosed with a broken bone in my left foot. I was instructed to wear the boot provided by the hospital, sit in a recliner, keep my leg elevated, and not put any weight on my left foot. I was instructed to follow up with an orthopedic doctor the following week. I went home and found it very hard to get from the car into the house. 
I couldn't figure out how to walk without putting my left foot down on the ground. My stomach was nauseous from the pain medicine. My husband and daughter assisted me into the house and sat me in a chair. I immediately passed out, and when I came to, my husband and daughter were concerned that I had had a stroke. They called 911, and I was transferred to Aurora Trauma Center. I was, was examined head to toe and again released with a diagnosis of a broken bone in my left foot. We live in a tri-level, and I was able to get to the lower level where there is a bedroom, a bathroom, and a family room. For the next six weeks, I would sit in the recliner with my left leg elevated and ice pack supplied. I also slept with a wedge that kept my leg elevated while I was sleeping. After experiencing more pain in my left leg, I was sent for an ultrasound, and the ultrasound found a hematoma on the inside of my left leg. Standing up was extremely painful, even without putting pressure on my left foot. It would take me a couple of times of standing and then sitting back down on the side of the bed until I could bring myself to hop on my right leg using a walker for balance to get to the bathroom or to the recliner. My husband had to help me in and out of bed due to the extreme pain in my lower left leg. I couldn't dress or undress myself, take a shower, go to doctor's appointments or to mass without his help. Every day he had to apply gauze wrap and an ace bandage to my left leg to cover the blisters so that they, as they would burst, they were covered. He then applied the boot sock and a boot. Every day for several weeks, he had to prepare all meals and bring them down on a tray to me. We were fortunate that he was working from home during this time. I had orthopedic appointments and three rounds of physical therapy. I am still going through physical therapy. After the bone healed in my foot, I was still experiencing pain in my ankle. The pain limited me. I had trouble walking normally, could not walk any great distance. Going up and down the stairs was best sitting on the stairs and going down that way. As time went on, I was frustrated that I could not perform the simple act of walking down the stairs. Before going to the third physical therapist, frustration set in as I thought I would always have pain and not be able to do all the things I enjoyed, such as pickleball, stand-up paddleboarding, kayaking, walking miles, and traveling. My third round of physical therapy found that the whole left side of my body was twisted from the impact of the vehicle. Mm. After 10 and a half months and three rounds of physical therapy, I am now 95% back to normal. Oh, good. All the months of suffering and thinking no one would be able to figure out what was wrong, I was worried that the pain Easy would remind me forever the choices Daryl Brooks made on November 21st, 2021. I wanted my life back. During this time of feeling, of a healing, I felt isolated and frustrated that the Advent and the Christmas season were happening and I was unable to decorate, shop, or participate as I usually would during the holidays. Emotionally, since being struck by the vehicle driven by Daryl Brooks, I have felt like a victim. Every day I was reminded that I was limited by physical pain and loss of self. The world went on, but I was stuck, not able to move forward. Today, I am taking the final step forward in my journey of coming out the other side of this incident. Life is starting to look like it was before November 21st, 2021. I know I am not the same person that I was before this trauma, but now I have an enhanced appreciation for life and a stronger sense of spirituality. I am grateful to have a supportive family, supportive friends, and my Catholic community of Waukesha who have all walked this road with me. Forgiveness is a choice. I know that I can forgive you, Daryl Brooks, without forgetting the trauma you caused, without you apologizing and acknowledging your actions. This may take some time for me to accomplish, but after today, I will not let your actions take over my life. I will move on. Regarding sentencing, Your Honor, I would like to request that due to Daryl Brooks's total lack of concern for human life on November 21st, 2021, that for each count that the jury returned a guilty verdict, Daryl Brooks received the maximum sentence for each of those counts. Thank you. Very nice. You know, I, 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 you'll be proud I refrained, but I was like, she was shuffling through those papers while that woman was speaking. I guess they can't do that, but I wish they would like make him sit and not have any of his papers or his Bibles to flip through because he's, you know, he's trying to ignore, you know, this is all about him, but not in a good way. 
It just irritates me when somebody's speaking that he's being so incredibly rude. But anyhow, see, and it just goes to show too, um, of course, it's, it is most tragic when younger people are hurt. But, you know, you can't, you know, this lady is older, but obviously she was active. She played pickleball and she kayaked. And, you know, just because you're older doesn't mean you don't, you're not active. And, you know, that was taken from her. And that's frustrating. And it's just, oh, I wish they would, mm, they would just take those papers away from him. But I digress. Flipping through your stuff. So annoying. Good morning. My name is Jeff Rogers. Um, my children were victims, oh, U and V. I remember him. Bless I'm a son. father of four, three of which were marching with me in the parade last November. Two of my children were struck and injured. I also serve as the president of the Waukesha Blazers baseball and fast pitch organization and was a couple, couple months into that job at the time of the parade. I've debated whether or not to read a statement for this sentencing. At the end of the day, I felt it necessary to have my voice heard for my sake, for my family's sake, and for the Waukesha Blazers' sake, and for all the other victims. I'm here today with families that I love, and I'm so sorry that this happened. First of all, this event was completely avoidable, and from my perspective, there has been zero remorse, sympathy, or acknowledgement of the victims by the defendant. All he had to do was stop the vehicle when he saw the crowd, and none of these lives would have been changed forever. For this reason alone, he needs to be locked up for the rest of his life. But enough about him. This is about the impact on, of the event on me, my family, and our Blazers organization. I'd like to speak as a father, first of all. The impact this has had on my family and I has been immense. This last year has been full of confusion, irritation, anxiety, and depression. We haven't been able to live a normal life. The trial has been dragged out, and literally we were pulled back through to relive everything, all because this person wouldn't admit it like a man and take what was coming to him. Damn right. My kids are oh. some of the strongest people I know, and they have proven that through the faith in God they've displayed throughout. However, the impact this has had on them literally makes me sick. No more parades, that joy is gone. This is something that will never leave them. I'm still learning things today as well about what they heard and saw that day. I pray every night that God continues to strengthen them to push through and know that he is in control. That night when we got home, I'll never forget Caden looking at me with glassy eyes. He looked up at me and said, I'm really glad Riley is okay, and started to cry. When my wife Stacy sat on the chair next to me that night, it felt different. She hugged me longer than normal, and a lot more firm than normal, and said, thanks for keeping our kids safe. Aww. Everyone saw on the videos that were shown, we we're literally inches away from losing three out of our four, four children, and myself included. I thank God each day that he spared us, and provided the adrenaline, courage, and strength to get my kids out of the way, gather all the kids we could, and pray together. My wife was going to come with us that night, along with our toddler son. I play things in my head over and over, imagining what could have been if she would have come. Where would she have been standing when that SUV barreled through? I have flashbacks most days to Maya's jacket slipping through my hand. If I wouldn't have grabbed it the second time, I know what the outcome would have been. Riley still has trouble sleeping, with some nights getting out of bed six, seven, eight, nine times because she heard a noise or doesn't feel safe. A few days ago, I was one-on-one -on -one in the car with her, and I finally apologized for not finding her right away. Oh my Thank goodness. God our friend found her and kept her safe, but as her dad, I've lived with the fact that I couldn't find all my kids that night after it happened. I went way too long not knowing where my kids were, with panic overwhelming me. As a father, I can confidently say that this incident had a year-long impossible impact on me and our family. Are we managing? Yes, of course, as God is in control. Now to speak as the Blazers president. This was a happy gathering and almost the kickoff of my presidency with the Blazers since I was only a couple months in. We are getting to know each other, welcoming a new coach, our new board members, and overall just ready to advertise our Blazers program. Looking back at the pictures from prior to the tragedy, we are so happy. So much love and camaraderie. We are ready for an awesome season. I spoke just prior about my perspective during the event as a father of three kids, but as the president of our organization, the weight of the moment to find an account for everyone felt like it was on my shoulders. We had nearly 35 people there. I knew I had lots of help, and for that, I can't thank the other parents and coaches enough. The moment was a blur, and gathering and putting kids up in the truck was the priority. From there, the kids I could find huddled with me in the theater, and we said a prayer for those injured and being attended to. 
I knew that the next few days were going to be intense, but I never fully grasped how crazy the following days, weeks, and months would be. The amount of turmoil and struggle for our Blazers organization was literally insurmountable. From the moment of the incident, the amount of media and law enforcement interaction was exhausting and unending. Media showing up at my door asking for individual participants' status. Unbeknownst to them, the two of my children were hurt. There was nonstop email flow, phone calls, planning, coordinating, and filtering through things. It was endless work. This job went from something I truly loved, from my biggest passion in life, to something I cried about for months. I went from giving speeches on Facebook Live about how cool our new indoor facility was to speaking at Jackson's funeral. From there, the community really pulled together. The amount of love and compassion that came our way was also unending. It was honestly overwhelming. For that, we cannot thank this community enough. Finally, I wanted to briefly touch on the true impact this has had on me. My faith was challenged over the past year, but I can confidently say it's stronger than ever. The hardest part about the whole incident was not knowing where my kids were, not having answers for what just happened, not knowing if more danger was coming. I knew I had Maya next to me, but when I went back and forth screaming for Caden and Riley, that horror plagues me every day. I go back to those moments quite often, and when I watch the videos during the trial, it brought back all those feelings. Pure and utter terror, that's what it was, and that's the impact it still has today. Finally, in closing, I'm a man of faith and wanted to share two Bible passages which have pushed me through. First of all, my confirmation passage, Joshua 1.9, it reads, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And secondly, I met with my pastor prior to testifying, and he provided me with an excellent part of scripture. Philippians 4 it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request oh, to God. stop nodding. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for listening, and may God strengthen us all. Bless him. And you know, I covered his testimony, and he witnessed Jackson and, and Hucker Sparks being hit and Daryl was horrible to him. I might do, I done like a lot of the witnesses that testified, but I might go back after this and, you know, separate it, you know, just do them one at a time so we can look at it because now that we hear everything that they've been through, it, it even puts a, huger impact on it but that's you know that poor man he took he felt so bad for so many things that he didn't have to you know and, and Daryl feels nothing about nothing and unbelievable look at him nodding yeah we you may know the scripture but you don't know how to follow it Daryl so don't even Gonzalez, and this is my husband, Juan Gonzalez Lopez. We represent the Blazers organization, as well as many others, and you could even argue the state of Wisconsin. Last night, as I thought about my statement, my son scooched over on the, cou over on the couch and snuggled into me. He laid with his head on my lap, and I stroked his hair. We stayed like that until it was time for bed. He knows we're here today. And it was as if he knew we needed a little extra love last night. Moments like these should be pure with love and affection. But since November 21st, they are mixed with flashes and images of what could have been. Mama, I'm here. I was on the other side. This is one of the memories and words that I'll never forget and hear dozens of times a day without warning. The relief I felt hearing those words on November 21st was devastating but I found my son unharmed. That should be the end of the story, right? We're fine, right? Aww. 
Physically, yes. But fine is a word we use when people ask us if we're okay. But we're not. It was only a short time before we had readied for the parade, got our hot cocoa, and took pictures to snap a shot of the fun about to be had. Before the parade, I left him with his teammate and new friend Jackson at the Blazers drop-off spot and walked my daughter to her dance team location. With my mother-in-law visiting from Mexico, she was excited for her first Christmas parade. Stationed at the corner of the Clark Hotel with friends, my daughter's dance group waved with smiles as they passed us. She was headed to the library where I would pick her up. The Dancing Grannies, one of our favorite groups, performed flawlessly as they passed us. My son's baseball group was after the extreme dancers who were within his sight. Then the gasps and screams came from everywhere and the red SUV sped past us. I yelled stop and put my hands out like I had the power to make it happen. I felt like I was punched in the stomach when I realized the SUV came from the direction of my son's group. Panicked and lightheaded and knowing my daughter was safe, I ran to find my son. Running through the streets, my legs felt like they had a life of their own. I found Jackson first. Oh. I saw his little body in his blazer's jersey. His eyes looking up, looking nowhere. I knew he was hurt badly. Seeing Jackson on the ground, I began looking for my son amongst the rest of the bodies. I screamed hysterically, searching frantically. What if spilled my head? I heard mom from so many directions, but it wasn't him. Finally, it was. I turned to see him with other blazers who were in the team truck. He called out to me, Mama, I'm here. I was on the other side. Yes, I found my son unharmed, but after the chaos continued, we ran. I covered his eyes as we rushed back to our group. I called my husband to tell him something terrible had happened, but had no words to explain. Headed for the library, we were told there was an active shooter. We ran again. I covered my son's head with my arms so bullets would hit me first. He cried. I tried to assure him and myself that things like this don't happen. At the library, I ran up the stairs and shouted for my daughter, who was huddled with a friend and her daughter. Yes, I found my children unharmed. But after, the pain and terror continued. After the parade, we discovered people had died, and then several people in my son's group were hit, including his coach and teammate. We learned that my son's teammate was in critical condition, but I already knew this. I still see his eyes without closing mine. What does it feel like to attend a funeral of a child your age? I hate that my kids know. I hate that I didn't get a chance to cheer on my son and Jackson during the baseball season last year. I hate that my son said it was weird having one less teammate. For more than a week, it was late nights to avoid sleep, and our family of four piled into one bed. There was no question this was a traumatic experience. Counselors were available. My son didn't want to talk about it. And today still doesn't. I tried to return to work. I tried to return to teaching. I couldn't make it through a day without feeling hypervigilant, startling at every noise, having a panic attack from the sound of a door, shout, thud, gasp, anything and everything. After the parade, I couldn't make it through a day. 
my joy disappeared. I felt guilty. I had no right to feel joy since my son and daughter were alive and others were not. Oh I was open about questions my kids had, but I cried and screamed in agony when they weren't around. I overreacted, shouting and pulling my kids near in the parking lots and streets or any time I saw a car come within a quarter mile away, convinced they all had ill intentions. PTSD throws all the punches. I left my career to work intensively on healing in a program for PTSD. I have only just returned to the workplace, only just a month ago. Something quieter, something with less action. Because after almost one year, some days still feel like November 21st was yesterday. Intrusive memories, hypervigilance, nightmares, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, anger, guilt, shame. These are all things I and others live with daily because Daryl Brooks drove through our joy and turned it to terror. When he suggested he could have hit more, he was wrong. He hit everyone. The toll this event has taken on everyone, physically hurt or not, is tremendous. And it sickens me to know that there are so many others with a similar story as ours. I know some today may offer forgiveness, but for me, forgiveness is for accidents for mistakes or poor choices that the offender expresses remorse for their actions. Daryl Brooks offers no remorse, but he did search for sympathy yeah, right there. That look tells you for there. himself. Mm -hmm. I cannot offer forgiveness. I will not. Daryl Brooks should be held accountable for every second of pain and trauma he inflicted on all of us that day including the many years inflicted already on Ms. Patterson. Free, he is and always will be a danger to society. With that, Your Honor, I ask that the full sentence is issued. He spends the rest of his days in prison without the chance of parole. Thank you. And I looked at her husband, I only had half of his face in there below, like he was looking over at Daryl with disgust, as I'm sure he would. Wow. You know, and all these people, so many of them have survivor's guilt. I mean, even though their child or loved one wasn't injured, everyone still suffers. The mental is real and it's horrific. And it's okay if you don't forgive him. He's kind of unforgivable, really. Just look at him. Wow. He's unbelievable. And look at our, um, our fellow behind him. He looks disgusted. He didn't like having to sit there in his shackles and his handcuffs having to listen to this. But he could at least have the decency to just Keep his head bowed like he did when he received all the guilty verdicts that were read. But he can't do that. He has to be expressive and disgusting. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, yeah. It's, oh, is it infringing on your time? Oh, my God. I want to slap his head off his shoulders. Probably not the only one. I'm Lindsay Cockle, and my family walked with the Waukesha Blazers. November 21st, 2021, my family walked in the Waukesha Christmas Parade. My boys were dressed proudly in their baseball jerseys, streets lined with smiling faces. The crowd was happy and excited. In a split second, excited cheers turned into sounds of screaming and horror. A trail of bloody bodies were left laying in the road. Gosh. My family was not physically injured that day. We somehow dodged the path of the car by inches. Our mental and emotional injuries were severe, and they remain a struggle for us every day. We have the image and the sound of an SUV plowing 
through people burned into our minds for the rest of our lives. My children were separated, and I ran through a trail of bloody bodies that were left laying in the road. I will not forget how many people I saw, some seizing in an intersection, some unconscious, and some not. My children cried themselves to sleep for weeks after and still do. They still wake up with nightmares, as do I. They could not walk in a parking lot without clinging to me, shaking and terrified that a car would try to run them down. Mm -hmm. We suffer from major panic attacks and PTSD, all from a day that was supposed to be happy and exciting. As parents, we have to try to help cope with, with our children, but we do not know how to cope ourselves. My children, my family, and I, and every person that we know will never be the same after that day. There were many people that were fortunate, fortunate enough to walk away unharmed. However, Jackson Sparks was not one of those people. A child, eight-year-old, walking next to his big brother with his whole life ahead of him. The next time my children wore their baseball jerseys was to a funeral. A funeral for an eight-year-old boy, their friend, their teammate, that they had spent many days playing and making memories at while at their brother's baseball game. His family and friends will never see his smiling face light up a room, and his team will never be able to celebrate a win with him on the baseball field ever again. Every moment of Jackson's life that was ahead of him was ripped away by Daryl Brooks. You, Daryl Brooks, you hid in a children's playhouse and ditched your hoodie in a sandal. That playhouse happened to be my children's at the house we just moved out of a couple of months prior. Wow. That playhouse was built for them, built for my sons. Wow. And you hid there after you left their friend and teammate lifeless in a road along with many others. Oh, wow. You didn't Sicko. just get lost in a parade route. You disregarded police and the safety of hundreds, and you disregarded life. You very selfishly ripped away the joy from the families who were there just to bring joy to others. There are many holes left in our community, but our community has grown stronger and we all have each other. You, however, will have no one. You will have no one you in sure a cell will. where you belong for the rest of your life. Thank you, Judge Doro, and we ask that please, he never see the light of day again. Well said. Oh, look at that, look at that right there. He thinks that's hilarious. How disgusting. He hid in that woman's child children's playhouse where they used to play that just makes it even more dirty and just look at that wow that right there that shows the true character of daryl brooks i'm so glad he's in there and dodge with chris rot watts i said rots but maybe that's what they all should be doing is rotting that's just sickening and you think it's some sort of joke he pretends he's close to his own kids that's disgusting all right okay breathe wow thank you There, we'll stop there. Where his look, see, it's just all like, oh, it's probably like, oh, can I go back to my cell? Hell no, you can't go back to your cell, Daryl. You're a disgusting individual. Oh my gosh. And just watching this and his reactions to these victims, sickening. Turn to your Bible. My name is Sherry Sparks. Oh boy. I am Jackson and Tucker's mom. I stand here today with my son Tucker and my husband Aaron. I'm here today to represent my family, but mostly for my boys, who were both struck down by the red SUV on November 21st. I want to give a voice to our son Jackson Sparks. Our family is forever changed. We are hurt, angry, traumatized, and broken. November 21st was a day that was supposed to be fun and filled with laughter and smiles. Instead, it became a nightmare full of fear, screams, and tears. Put the first one up. <laughs> okay. 
My boys were walking in the Waukesha Christmas Parade with their baseball teammates, friends, and coaches. It was a chilly and windy day that day, so we all layered up and prepared to kickstart our holiday season. We met up with our Blazers group, decorated the truck, prepared the buckets of candy and flyers for the boys, took some group photos, and then I left to go find my seat near the end of the parade row and wait for our group while enjoying the parade. I had no idea then the nightmare that was coming my way. Nor did I know that it would be the last time I would hear Jackson's voice and see his smile. I wish I would have known then that the hug he gave me before I went to sit down was the last hug I would ever get from him. I would have held on to him a lot longer. <laughs> After the red SUV flew past us, it was pure chaos. I will never ever forget the horrible sound of the car hitting bodies and the thud of bodies landing on the ground. I immediately grabbed my favorite plaid blanket, ran up the street to find my voice. What I found shook my world. I saw Jackson first in the arms of a police officer. He was running him to get him medical attention. My husband was right behind them and told me that Tucker had been struck also. He pointed me back to the direction where Tucker was. Can you do the second photo, please? That's Tucker underneath my blanket there, the plaid blanket. My world came crashing down at that moment. I wanted to scream. I wanted to throw up and cry. Adrenaline kicked in and I went to find my boy. I spotted Jackson's baseball hat lying in the road first. Oh my gosh. Then Tucker's hat. <clears throat> then I found Jackson's shoe, which kind of led me to Tucker. I finally spotted him. He was one of the many bodies lying in the road covered in blankets. I recognized the shoes on his feet. That's how I found him. They're sticking out from under the blanket. I stayed at Tucker's side as he lay in the road waiting for an ambulance to come back for him. He was semi-conscious, but we couldn't move him without a backboard due to his head being injured. They had run out of backboards. Luckily, a nearby shop owner slash hero dragged a door out of her shop to roll him onto so we could get him out of the cold and get him warm. An hour laying out in the cold road where he was thrown from impact. Jeez. You can go to the next photo, please. God's will, huh, This is huh, what we're facing next. Mm. Both boys had traumatic head and brain injuries. They both ended up in the ICU at Children's Hospital. The rooms just a few doors down from one another. The next day, Tucker asked us about Jackson, if he was okay or was he worse than himself. Do you have any idea how gut-wrenching it is to have to explain your 12-year-old son that his little brother isn't going to make it? His injuries are too extensive for his little body to come back from, and that he won't be coming home with us ever again. Leaving him at the hospital was brutal. To see the confusion, frustration, and hurt on his face when he's standing over his little brother's in his hospital room, taking in all the machines he was hooked up to. It... Tucker remembers everything up until the moment he was hit. He had actually turned around and saw the SUV coming towards them. He said Jackson was right next to him. He said he saw a few people get hit, and then he tried to run out of harm's way. He didn't make it. Being the protective big brother, Tucker blamed himself. He felt he should have tried to grab Jackson or done more to protect his little brother. Oh it broke my heart to hear him saying these things. Oh my goodness. Tucker's physical injuries were also severe. He still struggles with memory issues and brain processing speed. The mental and emotional damage is severe. Survivor's guilt, PTSD, anxiety, he still gets headaches. His little brother was taken from him. He's suddenly an only child now. He misses his little brother and his playmate. Jackson brought out the silly in him, and life will never be the same without him. You can go to the next photo. Every holiday, special event, family function, vacation, there will always be an empty chair or space where Jackson should be. Jackson's absence is very prominent. Mm -hmm. Every day we face that vacancy, and it triggers sadness and trauma. 
Jackson's life was taken from him and taken from us. Life isn't the same without him and it never will be. This morning, I should have spent the morning making him breakfast, taking him to school, hearing about his day later. Instead, I'm standing here in this courtroom asking for justice for my boys. We came so close to losing both of them that day. I miss Jackson every second of every single day. I feel gutted and broken. It hurts to breathe sometimes. It hurts to live without him here. My mama's soul aches for him. I am emotionally and mentally exhausted. The pain I carry with me every day feels so heavy. Yet I have to push forward, still be there to help Tucker heal and move forward with find our new normal. Can you read the next photo, please? As a family of faith, we know this man will face God's judgment someday for his actions. Until then, we feel it is this court's duty and responsibility to all the victims to sentence this man to the maximum penalty allowed under Wisconsin law for each and every guilty charge. We feel this man does not deserve to see freedom in our lifetime, nor our son Tucker's lifetime. We have learned throughout this trial that this man is incapable of empathy or remorse. He has shown no sympathy nor apology for all, the, all of the pain, <clears throat> suffering, and loss of life he has caused to so many. This man not only took Jackson away from our family, he violently ripped Jackson out of our lives. Jackson was only eight years old. Eight. He only had eight years here with us. He was robbed of everything. He will never get to hit a home run, catch frogs with his brother again, meet his wrestling hero, Braun Strowman. He won't ask a girl to prom. He won't go to college, get married, or have children of his own. Jackson will never be able to do any of these things. These milestones will never happen. He was a bright light in our lives. He was very shy to most people, but those close to him, to his family, he was a big ball of energy. He was charismatic and full of light and life. His life was cut out way too short. Jackson and the other victims deserve justice. We deserve closure in order to heal and find our new normal. We hope to achieve that today. Thank you. And thank you, prosecution, Judge Doro. Very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, at this time, Your Honor, we'd like... Oh, gosh. Did I really have to pause it there? You know, that is just um, heart-wrenching. It really is heart-wrenching to think about how much Tucker, his brother, was injured and may never be the same physically or obviously mentally. And he's going to say it's God's will. I think he still, in his twisted mind, believes that. That is just, did you see, everybody was here, yeah, Zach was, but I don't know if y'all noticed, but Zach turned and gave a big, obvious glare to Daryl, as I'm sure many people were. That's just, um, and in fact, I'm going to, of course, I'm going to continue on. I don't know what it is, but out of respect for Jackson, sounds weird, but I think I'll end this video with that last um, victim's impact, but there's plenty more, but that will be good for today because that's, that's a tough one. So I'll have the next one up probably in the next couple of days. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, commenting, subscribing. I really appreciate you hanging in there with me. I know we have a lot of people that are, I don't want to say Daryl fans, but fans of this not because of him. It's just, I think it's like me. This is the first trial, one of my first trials that really got me on YouTube. And I didn't even really know that I was going to go with this, let alone other trials. But this was the, the number one just because it was so incre incomprehensible. Number one, that someone would defend himself. And number two, had so much evidence there was no way he was going to win this but he really thought he would and and just the I can't even explain it the, the time that he wasted all the people that he tormented and he he's always worried about his rights people being disrespectful that's just a bunch of crap 
But anyhow, we will continue on with this. And I love you all so much. Be kind to someone. Be kind to you. And I will see you the next time.